A few days ago, I noticed that Wizards of the Coast released this free Dungeons & Dragons adventure online. It's a PDF that you can download. When I did my read-through of Dragons of Stormwreck Isle, uh, several people seemed to have liked that, and I got quite a few comments asking me to read more adventures. And I would certainly like to do that, but many of the adventures are just way too long to read. So um, when I saw this one come up, I thought this would be a good opportunity to do another read-through. Uh, so we'll get started here, but just before we get into it, I do want to let everyone know, you know, I'm not a professional YouTuber, I'm not a professional voice actor, or anything like that. So I probably will make mistakes in my reading, I'll mispronounce things, I will probably stumble over my words from time to time. I apologize in advance for that, and I will say if that kind of thing bothers you, uh, please just go ahead and click off the video. <laughs> Having said that, I will uh, read through this as smoothly as I can. So let's go ahead and get started. Starting the adventure. Estimated time to play this encounter, 10 minutes. When you and the other players are ready to begin the adventure, read the following. Okay, so we have a big block of text here that the DM would be reading out loud to the players. You are from the village of Pinebrook, a small settlement near the base of a mountain range called the Spine of the World. In addition to their normal jobs, the citizens of Pinebrook take turns patrolling the forest and hill around the village, making sure the area is safe for the loggers who work in the forest and the miners who dig in the mountains for iron ore. Today, it's your turn to patrol the forest with some of your friends. Dangerous creatures sometimes wander the woods, but it has been safe recently. Rumors have spread through the area that a friendly silver dragon recently established a lair in the nearest mountain. The more hostile creatures of the mountains, especially the dangerous ice trolls, haven't been seen in the past two months. Yesterday, however, a patrol saw large, frosty troll footprints in the forest. Could the rumors of a friendly silver dragon be just rumors after all? Your patrol today is led by the head of the village guards, Captain Imogene Cole. Captain Cole glances nervously at the forest trail before she nods at your group. I've not patrolled with any of you before. Tell me a little about yourselves. Okay, so that's the end of the block text. Ask each player to give their character's name or nickname and describe what they look like. They can reveal the things they are carrying that the other adventure uh, that the other characters would see, explain what attacks and skills they have, and maybe even describe their personalities. They can use their character sheets as props. Role playing. D&D lets players act as their characters. Players might use a different voice or move as their character might, but if a player isn't comfortable role-playing in that way, they can describe their character as if from a book or story instead. It's okay if some players seem hesitant to talk or have trouble role-playing. It's more important to make the players feel comfortable than to make them talk. To help them feel more comfortable with role-playing, consider asking them one or two of the following questions. Uh, what's your character's name or nickname? What does your character look like? What does your character sound like when they talk? What is your character good at doing? What does your character carry as they patrol the forest? How does your character feel about being on patrol the day after evidence of ice trolls was found in this area. Once all the characters have introduced themselves, Captain Cole speaks again, and here again we enter into the block text. Well, this forest needs to be patrolled, so let's get to it. I'm ready to fight if we have to. Let the players respond for their characters if they want to, then describe how Captain Cole moves carefully into the forest, motioning for the characters to follow. Proceed to encounter one, a not-so-fearsome dragon. 
Encounter 1, a not-so-fearsome dragon. Estimated time to play this encounter is 10 minutes. After the characters follow Captain Cole into the forest, read the following. Okay, so just we're getting into block text again. You move along the forest trail for 15 minutes before Captain Cole stops and holds up a hand. Do you hear that? She asks. You're going to make a perception check to see if you can hear what Captain Cole hears. Perception is listed on your character sheet under skills. Each of you should roll a 20-sided die and add the number next to your perception skill on your character sheet. Then tell me the total of your perception check. And that's the end of that block text. Perception checks. A player rolls a d20 and adds the modifier written next to the perception skill on their character sheet to make a perception check. The difficulty class to succeed on this check is 10, written as DC 10. So if anyone gets a perception check of 10 or higher, you explain that they hear a noise coming from the thorny forest underbrush. If no character succeeds on the perception check, Captain Cole points in the direction of the sound. Continue reading. Okay, so we enter into the uh, block text. The underbrush at the edge of the trail rustles as a creature the size of a large dog crawls from the thorns and leaves. At first, the creature looks like a strange lizard made of metal. But as you look more closely, you see that it is a small dragon with blue-gray scales and a long, pointy tongue. As the dragon crawls in your direction, it feebly tries to scrape pieces of silver eggshell off its head and face. It makes a hissy, whimpering sound. And that's the end of that block text. Ask the players what they want to do. Let them play their characters as they react, talk, speculate, and investigate further. As long as the characters don't try to hurt the baby silver dragon, Captain Cole simply stares in confusion, unsure what to do next. Role-playing and information. The players will probably ask questions throughout the adventure. To give the players the proper information, try dividing answers into the following three categories. Information the characters know. If the players ask about information their characters would know, you can tell them that information. For example, the characters always know what they see, hear, and smell. Information the characters might know. Players might learn information based on their character's skills. For instance, Shalefire or Galantine could ask if this is a baby silver dragon. As the DM, you can have their players make a DC 10 check with an appropriate skill to see if they know the answer to that question. Shalefire could use the animal handling skill, while Galantine could use the nature skill. If they succeed on the check, D20 plus skill modifier is 10 or higher, you can tell them, yes, this is a newborn silver dragon. You might add that they often eat meat and other food as well. Information the characters don't know yet. A question like, where did this baby dragon come from? Is something the characters don't know, at least not yet. When this happens, you can simply say, "Mm, you're not sure, but you can try to find out. If the characters fail their checks or don't ask the right questions, You can have Captain Cole provide information. She can confirm that this is a baby silver dragon, and she refuses to allow the characters to harm it in any way. After the players ask all their questions and roleplay their reactions to the dragon, read the following. Okay, so we're going to enter into a block of text that you read to the players. Captain Cole pulls a book from her backpack. The Practically Complete Guide to Dragons. She flips to the middle of the book. It's true. This is a newborn silver dragon. The mother's lair must be in the nearest mountain just beyond the forest, as the rumors said. We need to get this baby to its mother quickly. 
I wonder how the baby got so far from home. Captain, Hull, uh, Captain Cole hesitates, then sighs. I must return to Pinebrook and tell them what we found. I need you to take the baby to the lair and its, and its mother. Protect this dragon with your lives. Trails in the forest lead right up to the mountain. Give this poor thing a name and get it some food. It looks weak. She tears a page from the book and holds it out. Here, this might be useful. According to the book, silver dragons are peaceful and usually like people. Okay, that's the end of that block text. The page Captain Cole gives the characters is found in Appendix A. It contains translations of Draconic, the language of dragons, into the common language the characters know. The characters don't need to read it now, but the information will be useful in the adventure. Well, I can't resist. I have to scroll to Appendix A and look at this thing. <laughs> so those are the character sheets. So it's probably down a bit farther. Character reference. All right, one moment. I'm just scrolling through the PDF trying to find Appendix A. So let me find it. Ah, here we are. Oh, I scrolled right past it, got it. Okay, so yeah, it's just a sheet that has uh, just simple translations. What the word means in common with what the word uh, sound is in Draconic. So an example they have listed here would be uh, Litrix in Draconic means armor. Uh, Vorel in Draconic means beautiful. And there's probably, I don't know, maybe a hundred of these translations total. Okay, and yeah, if you're actually playing with people in person, you could um, have that printed out and hand it to them. Or if you're playing online, you could take a screenshot and hand them the, uh, give them a digital copy of it. Okay, moving on. Feeding and care. After Captain Cole leaves, the characters should attempt to find food for the dragon. You may want to point out that all the characters have rations listed on their character sheets under other equipment. Alternatively, Shalefire can make a DC-10 survival check, or Galantine can make a DC-10 nature check to find berries and nuts the dragon can eat. Remind players how to make D2... Remind players how to make d20 rolls if needed. After the dragon is fed, it says one word. Nitha. That's spelled N-Y-T-H-A. And I'm assuming the pronunciation is Nitha. The characters won't learn this until later, but the baby just called the characters Mama in Draconic. Once the dragon eats, it perks up and follows the characters. They can carry the dragon, who enjoys the attention. The dragon also loves belly rubs. Aw, so cute. Moving the adventure forward. The mountain Captain Cole pointed the characters toward is visible above the trees. When the characters are ready, proceed to encounter two living icicles. Encounter two, living icicles. Estimated time to play this encounter, 10 minutes. Tell the players that the woods are quiet as the characters travel through the forest. They easily find the trails that lead to the mountain and no forest creatures bother them. When the characters arrive at the base of the mountain, read the following. So here we go with the block text. By carefully following the correct forest trails, you arrive at the base of the mountain. You can see a cave opening not far ahead. If a dragon built a lair in the mountain, this would be an obvious entrance. That's the end of the block text. This cave is only visible. This cave is the only visible entrance leading to the dragon's lair. When the baby dragon gets near the entrance, it sniffs the air and struggles to move closer recognizing the smell of home. As the characters move closer to the cave, read the following. Here we go with the block text. The cave entrance is wide and filled with sunlight, 
but the cave quickly grows dark beyond, with no way to see if there is anything inside. Broken icicles and patches of frosty snow cover the ground at the cave entrance. Suddenly, the shards of ice begin to twitch. The icicles and snow come together to form small ice creatures with wicked pointy claws. One of them cries, Intruders! Slash them good! As they attack. And that's the end of the block text. So you're entering into your first uh, combat with your players here. Five living icicles dwell in the cave entrance. If you are playing this adventure with fewer than four characters, remove one living icicle per player missing. Uh, let, me, let me reread that part. If you are playing this adventure with fewer than four characters, remove one living icicle per player missing to a minimum of two living icicles. Use the information below to play the living icicles during combat. Okay, so if you have four players, then you want to use five living icicles. If you only have three players, then you want to use four. And if you have two players, then you would use uh, two living icicles. And apparently, if, you're, if it's just you and one other player, you still have two living icicles. So living icicles have an armor class of 10, and they have seven hit points. Their attack is Claws, which is a melee weapon attack with plus 2 to hit, and it does 1d6 slashing damage. Read the following to get the players ready for their first combat. Okay, here we go with the block text. Get ready for your first combat. Look at the attack section on your character sheet. If you want to make a melee attack, your character needs to move up to the icicle creatures. If you want to make a ranged attack, you can stay back. Roll a d roll a 20-sided die and add the modifier listed by the attack you're using. Tell me the total and I'll tell you if the attack hit or missed. If you hit, roll a 6-sided die and the damage modifier listed by the attack you're using and tell me the total. So I guess there's no concept of initiative in this basic game, which is fine. Okay, taking turns. First, describe how the monsters are vicious and the danger they present. Highlight how sharp their claws are. Try to make the players feel as if they're in a battle for their characters' lives. If the monsters make one or two successful attacks, that helps with this feeling. Let the characters act first starting with the player on your left and going clockwise. Okay, so the, yeah, there's no initiative. It's just a uh, round-robin sequence. Ask each player what they want to do and encourage them to describe their actions so everyone can imagine what the scene looks like. After all the players have acted, any undefeated living icicles attack. Each monster that still has hit points moves to a different character and makes an attack using their claws. Roll a d20 and add the attack modifier plus 2 to the roll. If the total equals or exceeds the armor class of the character being attacked, the attack hits. Roll 1d6 and tell the player to subtract that damage from their hit points. If the attack misses, nothing happens. Either way, describe the attack. Do the claws rend open a wound or rake harmlessly off armor. Continue taking turns until all the living icicles are defeated. You can describe the living icicles shattering or melting as they're defeated, or perhaps the living icicles flee when they're defeated. Just make it clear to the players that the living icicles can't be chased and caught, perhaps by having them flow into narrow cracks in the mountainside where the characters can't follow. DM tip. Running an exciting combat in D&D is like a thrilling amusement park ride. The players often want to be scared and excited, but they don't want the excitement to lead to certain character death. This is where you can perform storytelling and mathematical magic. You can intervene if the characters seem to be losing the battle. For instance, 
you can give the characters advantage on attack rolls or give the monsters disadvantage on attack rolls. See the using the rules section earlier in this document for details about advantage and disadvantage. Changing probabilities like this can improve the character's odds in defeating the monsters. Rather than having a monster attack one character until they fall unconscious, have the monster attack a different character each turn. This tactic keeps more characters in the fight longer. You can even say the baby dragon rushed in and took down a monster, but try not to use outside help very often. After the characters succeeded, once the living icicles are defeated, ask the players what they want to do next. If they need help, suggest they search the area. Searching the area. Some monsters carry treasure, so it's often a good idea for characters to search the monsters as well as the area around them. Unless treasure is hidden, the characters can easily find it without having to make a check. Just inside the cave entrance, the characters find a worn leather backpack. Inside the backpack are the following items. A package of dried meat, five torches, flint and steel for starting fire, and a pouch containing 12 gold pieces. Dividing treasure. Let the players divide up the treasure as they wish. If they start to argue over who gets what, use the dragon to calm everyone down. The baby cries if the, if the characters argue. <laughs> Healing injured characters. If any characters took damage from the living icicles, the best way to heal the damage is for Evendon to use their special ability to cast a spell called Cure Wounds. Shalefire also has a special ability to heal their own damage, but only once during the adventure. The full rules of D&D have other ways to heal damage, but this adventure relies on Evendon's spells, Shalefire's special ability, and on other healing opportunities later in the adventure. What did we just fight? Living icicles are magical creatures that ice trolls sometimes use to guard places. A character who succeeds on a DC 10 check using skills such as Arcana or History knows this and can tell the other characters what they know. Moving the adventure forward. The baby dragon tries to run into the cave. When the characters are ready, proceed to encounter three, a dangerous lair. Encounter three, a dangerous lair. Estimated time to play this encounter, 15 minutes. After defeating the living icicles and entering the cave, the characters must contend with the hazards and dangers of the tunnels that lead to the silver dragon's lair. When the characters enter the cave, read the following. Here's a small block of text we'll read, the DM would read to the players. The front of the cave is lit by sunlight coming through the opening, leaving the back of the cave in darkness. The cave walls contain rough chalk drawings of creatures that look like trolls dancing and working. That's the end of that block text. Ask the players to make either a DC 10 history or religion check for their characters. Although Evandon, although Evandon is the only character who has a bonus to their religion skill, and Galantine is the only character with a bonus to their history skill, the other players can still attempt a history or religion check. The players just don't add anything to the d20 roll when they do. If any of the characters succeeds on the skill check, tell the players that ice trolls once lived and worked in the cave. Even if no one succeeds on the skill check, continue by reading the following. Okay, so we have a block of text that we'll read, the DM would read to the players. The baby dragon gets more excited after entering the cave, as if it knows it's close to home. Barely visible in the shadows at the back of the cave, a passageway turns into a tunnel that slopes upward toward the center of the mountain. And that's the end of that block text. Because the cave is dark and spooky beyond the entrance, 
the players need to use the torches found in the worn leather backpack to light their way as they explore. The flint and steel in the backpack can be used to light the torches. Reaching the lair. The characters must overcome three challenges to safely reach the hatchling cavern of the silver dragon's lair. Each challenge can be overcome in a variety of ways, using skills, equipment, or attacks. The challenge descriptions suggest potential ways characters can overcome each challenge. However, if the players come up with other ways that might work, let them make a d20 roll that somehow connects to their idea. Imagination often leads to an even more creative story. Challenge 1. Climbing Icy Walls As the characters move through the passage, read the following. So we have a short block of text here that the DM would read. The cold, frosty passage continues until you reach an ice-covered wall. The passage continues 50 feet above. You'll have to climb the wall to move deeper into the mountain. That's the end of that block text. Characters must succeed on a DT... On a, Characters must succeed on a DC-10 athletics or acrobatics check to climb the wall. If a character fails the check, roll 1d6. Tell the player to subtract that number from the character's hit points to re represent the damage the character takes from falling before they eventually reach the top. Nora has a climber's kit on her character sheet under other equipment. That gives her advantage on the check. If a character who reaches the top has a rope, they can lower the rope to help the other characters. Characters who use the rope can reach the top without making a check. The passage then continues upward. DM tip. If a character carries the baby dragon and falls during the climb, the dragon does not take damage. You can reward a character protecting the baby dragon by giving them advantage on certain rules. Challenge 2. Magical Ice Mirror As the characters continue, read the following. So we're going to have a block of text here that the DM reads. The winding, upward sloping passage is interrupted by a thin sheet of solid ice. Through the ice sheet, you can see the passage continues on the other side. As your torchlight flickers, the ice suddenly becomes as reflective as a mirror, its surface shimmering strangely. In those reflections, you and your companions are silver dragons, and the baby dragon looks like a human toddler with silver skin. And that's the end of that block text. Let the players roleplay and react to this unique discovery, and then continue. And the DM would read this block text. The head of a large, platinum-colored dragon appears in the ice and speaks. You understand the words of the dragon. You understand the words the dragon speaks, even though it isn't speaking in a language you know. You are on a blessed quest. You must speak the correct words in the correct language to enter the lair of one of my children. What two words correctly answer this question? What type of creature are you escorting home? That's the end of that block text. Ask the players to make a DC-10 Arcana, History, or Religion check. If a character succeeds on the check, tell them that the figure in the ice represents Bahamut, the god of the metallic-colored dragons, brass, bronze, copper, gold, and silver. The correct answer to the question is Silver Dragon. However, the characters must say this in the Draconic language. They can use the page from Captain Cole's book to find the correct words. Orn Darestrix. <laughs> if the players need help answering the question, or if they get the answer partially right, Bahamut's reflection can provide hints such as, you have one word correct, but you need the other. If any character speaks the correct words, read the following. 
So the DM would read this block text. The ice mirror instantly melts, splashing you all with icy cold water. But instead of freezing you, the water tingles as it runs down your skin, clothes, and armor. It feels wonderful. And that's the end of that block text. Bahamut blessed this water. Tell your players that the healing magic restores each character's hit points to the maximum amount listed on their character's sheets. Additionally, each character has advantage on the first roll they make in the next challenge, the ice slides. Characters might use other methods of getting past the ice mirror, such as melting the ice with a torch or smashing it with a weapon. If they do that, however, they don't receive Bahamut's healing magic. Also, a character who breaks the mirror takes damage. Roll 1d6 and tell the player to subtract that number from their character's hit points when it shatters. DM tip. Even if the players roll poorly, always allow them to continue forward in the adventure. Consequences for failing challenges might include characters losing hit points, which might make the final encounter more challenging, but you don't want to prevent the characters from continuing with the adventure because of bad luck. Challenge 3, Navigating the Ice Slides. The final stretch of tunnels lead, leading to the Silver Dragon's hatch, hatchling cavern is made of several icy slides that join, separate, and crisscross each other as they descend. Read the following. So the DM would read this block text. The passage has taken you higher and higher, and now you stand atop an icy cliff, looking down into a huge cavern inside the mountain. Slides made of stone and ice provide a way down, but they're steep and slick. Furthermore, these slides merge, crisscross, and loop around each other in a dizzying maze. The slides look like the only way forward. Some end in solid ice walls. Others are covered with razor-sharp icicles. You need to choose the best slides to get down. Suddenly you hear a cracking sound. <coughs> the cliff you're standing on is starting to collapse. If you don't jump on a slide now, you'll fall. And that's the end of that block text. Each character must quickly jump on one of the slides. Once a character starts to slide, they can't stop. However, they can switch to a different intersecting slide while zipping down at high speed. Finding the best path. Before starting to slide, the characters can try to quickly figure out which slide is safest. Ask the players to make a DC 10 investigation or perception check to determine the best choice. If a character succeeds on this check, they choose the best slide to reach the bottom safely. The character doesn't take any damage, but you can describe the wild ride they experience as they slide toward the cavern floor. Changing slides. A character who fails the checks jumps onto a slide and quickly reaches dangerous sections of razor-sharp ice shards, long drops, ice walls, and other hazards. This character must succeed on a DC 10, excuse me, a DC 15 acrobatics or athletics check to jump to a safer slide to avoid taking damage. A character who doesn't have acrobatics or athletics on their character sheet can still make checks with those skills, but they don't add any modifier to the D20 roll, so they would have to roll a natural 15 or higher. If a character fails the check, roll 1d6. Tell the player to subtract that number from their character's hit points to represent the damage they take while reaching the bottom of the slide. Describing the action. As the characters ride these dangerous slides, think about ways that you or the players might describe how the characters jump from one slide to another, go through loops and rolls, and narrowly missing hitting each other. Give the players a chance to describe what their characters are going through. DM tip. If one character makes a check to find a safe path down the slides, the other players 
might say their characters follow on the same slide, which might make this challenge too easy. You can increase the challenge by saying the top of the safe slide collapses just after the first character sl starts to slide down it. You can do this each time a new character chooses a slide to ensure that each character has to navigate their own path. Moving the adventure forward. It's a short walk from the bottom of the cave to the hatch, hatching cavern. The characters are ready to face the final threat. Proceed to encounter four dragon eggs and soaring silver. Encounter four dragon eggs and soaring silver. Estimated time to play this encounter, 15 minutes. When the characters enter the hatching cavern, read the following. So this is the block text that the DM reads. This large chamber is filled with stalactites and stalagmites covered in ice. The ceiling slopes up toward an ice-plugged hole far above you. On the ground in the center of the chamber... Two large silver eggs rest upon heaps of frozen snow. A third spot now holds nothing but broken shell pieces. A fourth spot looks like it also held an egg, but that egg is missing. Between you and the eggs stand two strange creatures the size of horses. They have bodies like frogs, but their skin is pure white, and they have mouths full of sharp teeth. The creatures are moving threateningly toward the two remaining eggs in the nest, but you have interrupted them. They turn toward you and hiss. Then, with powerful hops, they hurl themselves towards you. That's the end of the block text. These creatures are egg snatchers, trained by ice trolls to steal dragon eggs. If the characters don't intervene, the last two eggs will be lost. There are three egg snatchers. If you have three or fewer players, remove one egg snatcher, leaving the characters with two enemies. If you have two or fewer players, reduce the starting hit points of the two egg snatchers to 10. So the egg snatchers have an armor class of 12, and they have 18 hit points unless you modify according to uh, how it was described previously. They have a bite attack, which is a melee weapon attack, which has plus four to hit, and it will do 1d6 plus two piercing damage. This combat runs the same way as in Encounter 2, Living Icicles. Refer to the DM tip in that encounter to remind the players how to make melee and ranged attacks if, ne if you need. Taking turns. Let the characters act first, starting with the player on your left and going clockwise. Ask each player what they want to do. After all the players have acted, any undefeated egg snatchers attack. Each monster that still has hit points moves to a different character and makes an attack with their bite. Roll a d20 and add the attack modifier plus 4 to the roll. If the total equals or exceeds the armor class of the character being attacked, the attack hits. Roll 1d6 and add the damage modifier plus 2. Tell the player to subtract that damage from their hit points. If the attack misses, nothing happens. Either way, describe the attack. Perhaps a bite clamps around an ankle, or maybe the egg snatcher breaks a tooth on a piece of armor. Describe the egg snatchers falling to the ground as they are defeated or fleeing into the darkness too fast for the characters to follow. DM tip. A character that reaches zero hit points falls unconscious and remains unconscious until they regain hit points through healing. At the end of the encounter, any unconscious player regains one hit point automatically. After the characters succeed... Once the egg snatchers are defeated, the baby dragon crawls into the nest, settles among the broken eggshells, and falls asleep. Aww. 
moving the adventure forward. Before the characters can do anything else, the mother dragon returns. Read the following. This is the DM block text. A loud crash erupts from high above. Chunks of ice and snow fall around you as an enormous silver dragon bursts through a frozen section of the cavern ceiling. The dragon plummets and lands before you, frigid air streaming from between sharp teeth. What is happening here? The dragon roars. The characters have some explaining to do. Proceed to the conclusion. Conclusion. Estimated time to play this encounter, 10 minutes. The angry silver dragon waits for the characters to explain themselves. This is an opportunity for the players to roleplay as their characters. During the conversation, you can have the dragon reveal that her name is... I'm just going to go with Rorn for short because I can't pronounce that. The dragon section below gives you more information to help you roleplay the silver dragon. If the players are reluctant to speak, ask one of the following questions. The dragon has asked you, what are you doing here? What do you say? How does your character feel about standing before an incredibly angry dragon the size of a small house? What can you do or say to the dragon to prove to her that you came here to return her baby? As long as the characters don't do anything silly, Rorn quickly realizes they aren't here to steal her eggs, but are returning her baby instead. DM tip. Dragons are incredibly powerful. If the players decide to have their characters attack Rorn, you can handle the situation in different ways. The dragon looks at them with disappointment and tells them to stop being silly. Ask the characters to make nature checks, then tell the characters with the highest check that they know a dragon this powerful could defeat all the characters easily. Let the characters make attacks or cast spells if they like, then tell, the dra- then tell them the dragon ignores those attempts to harm her. If the characters continue acting hostile or belligerent, Rorn uses her magical dragon breath on them. This leaves the characters unhurt, but unable to move. She then leaves them outside the mountain unharmed, but they don't get any reward from her. The dragon. Here are some characteristics of the silver dragon you can use to roleplay her. Rorn is an adult silver dragon. Her full name translates to Soaring Silver. She tells the characters to call her Rorn since it's easier for non-dragons to say than her full name. Yeah, no kidding. If the characters explain what happened, the dragon quickly calms down and thanks them for rescuing her baby. Rorn is friendly when not angered, and she likes people. In peaceful times, she likes to spend her time sharing stories with folks. If the characters ask about the name Neetha, that the baby dragon said, Rorn explains that it means mama in the draconic language. Rorn says... Dragons call their young wormlings, not babies. Warren can also share details of what happened to her eggs. Warren recently made her lair here to prepare for the hatchling of her wormlings. She drove away the dangerous ice trolls who lived here. As her eggs were getting close to hatching, the ice trolls attacked Warren and stole one of her eggs. Warren chased the egg thieves and has been gone from the lair for several hours. The ice trolls took the egg into a tunnel in another mountain, but Warren couldn't fit into the tunnel. She doesn't know where it might lead. The rescued wormling tells its mother what happened to it, which Warren can also share with the characters. The wormling hatched while Warren was chasing the egg thieves, finding itself alone. It wandered from the lair into the forest. The characters found the wormling and took good care of it on the way home. More wormlings. As the characters speak with Warren, the other two eggs hatch. Warren watches carefully as the wormlings break their shells and then crawl over to nuzzle their mother. 
She pulls some frozen meat from the nest and feeds them. The reward. After the other two baby dragons hatch, Warren speaks to the characters. Read the following. So this is the DM block text. Warren thanks you for your help. Please take these as a sign of my gratitude. She digs into the snow where the eggs were set and pulls out a small, shiny diamond for you. More importantly, you have already bonded with my first hatchling. He deserves to continue to learn what it is like to grow up in a realm of people. Would you be willing to take him back to your settlement and raise him? I will watch over your area to help you out, and I'm always here if you have any questions. The dragon continues. I have another question for you. When I find the exact location where the ice trolls took my final egg, would you retrieve it so my child can be safe from whatever the ice trolls have planned for them? And that's the end of that block text. Let the characters react to Warren's offer. No matter how the characters respond to Warren's requests, she is kind and polite to them if they are kind and polite to her. Treasure. Each of the small diamonds is worth 50 gold pieces. Each character can add this to their character sheet under other equipment. Return to Pinebrook. At the conclusion of the conversation, Warren shows the characters a secret passage that leads from the mountain, which ends the characters' adventures for now. Okay, so that is the end of Peril in Pinebrook. I hope you enjoyed listening to this adventure.